Hi guys, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth coming at you from a closet in North Carolina. Hey, this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. How's it going? It's going good. I have had a crazy day, crazy week. Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't gotten the chance to tell you this, but we just got this email today saying that our school will most likely be 100% virtual learning. Oh, all semester. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No option. No options of like, you can send your school if you want, send your kids to school if you want to. It's like, this is what we think we're going to do in North Carolina. Oh my gosh. I am so dreading whatever's coming down the pike in 10 days <laughs> for us. Wait, why 10 days for you? That's when they're. They're announcing July 20th. That's what they told oh, us. Oh, I understand. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Wake County, our county has not decided yet. Or the No, I'm sorry. The county has, the governor of North Carolina has not. But we, you know, go to a different kind of school so they can do what they want. And I may egg their houses. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come and join you. I'll, I'll make that trek just for that experience. Don't you know, like, that's the responsible new virtual teacher thing to do. <laughs> Congrats to me. Oh yeah. my gosh. I don't know. They say it's going to be very different than it was in the spring because now they're prepared and they can give us like, but I have three. Like, oh, and poor, poor, I'm sorry. I'm not going to mention names. Little guy who's starting kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that stinky? Oh, it's dang. fine. So, you know what that means in my house? That means that it's cocktail hour. <laughs> I was going to say, the drinking is not going to slow down. Happy <laughs> hour. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, what's going on in, in your world? Tell me about the things that are better than me. That are better than my <laughs> things. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, there's really not a whole lot going on. Um, football started this week. So our oldest is um, starting high school. So they started oh high school Lord. football camp. Yeah, it's fun. So at least he's had something to do for like two and a half hours every day. And we had a couple of kids just stay for those days and eat all our food and <laughs> drink all our drinks. Well, not those kinds of drinks, but you know, just sodas and <laughs> all the catered. Did they stink up your house? Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. I walked up to a point. Oh, dang it. <laughs> Bleep. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was like, what in the world smells in here? <laughs> like, can you guys please give me all your dirty laundry? I do not mind doing extra laundry if you don't leave it in this room. Please. Thank you. <laughs> I don't yeah, even think I'd so. want to do the laundry. I'm going to make use of that mask. Oh, I pretty much just threw it in the washing machine and then in the dryer. And I was like, y'all can sort out your own underwear. I don't need to be doing that for you. <laughs> God bless you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, let's talk about somebody else's bad life. <laughs> okay. Sounds good to me. To. I'm going to tell you about... A crazy case that I found this week and I'm so excited about it and I just really have become obsessed with this case. Mm. I don't know what it was about this one particular one but it is so interesting to me that I can't stop even though I have all the information that I need to report on it effectively in 30 to 40 minutes I cannot stop. <laughs> so, oh gosh I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, let's see what you think about it. I'm going to tell you the story today of Mike and Kathleen Peterson. Hmm. Have you heard of this case? No. Mm -mm. I mean... Michael Peterson. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of the other Peterson. Was that Lacey? Lacey Peterson? But Oh, Scott and Lacey. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Interesting. Okay. okay. So I'm going to talk about Michael first. Mr. Michael Peterson was born in 1943 in Nashville, Tennessee. Ooh, love me some Nashville. I know. It's like literally one of our favorite places 
ever. Best girls trip ever. Guys, mm-hmm. go to, go to Nashville with your girlfriends. So Mike was the son of a military officer, and he loved to read and loved books. And he actually went to Duke University in oh. Durham, North Carolina. Love me some and, Duke, too. <laughs> yes, I do, too. And he graduated there in 1965 and enlisted in the Marines. And he actually fought in Vietnam. And then he became an analyst for, like, a government think tank. So he was super smart. And he met and married a lady in 1966 by the name of Patty. And they lived in West Germany. Patty was the teacher. Oh, wow. And while they were living in West Germany, they had two sons, Clayton and Todd, and loved it there. They loved it in Germany. They both had great jobs and were very happy in their marriage with their two sons. And they became very close with a couple named George and Elizabeth Elizabeth Ratliff. And in 1983, George, the husband, like the friend of theirs... Um, died in what I think was a military incident. I don't know if it was combat. And I don't, I only saw like little mention of that. So I'm not a hundred percent sure how he died, but so he died in 83. And then in 1985, Elizabeth, their friend was found dead after falling down the stairs. Whoa. So, okay. The way that I picture these people is that they're kind of like, we are. Like, he's friends with the husband. She's mm. best best friends with the wife. Their kids are friends. And they just all hang out all together. Like, the whole family. They become a family. Mm. So, now, both of these parents have passed away. And they had two daughters named Margaret and Martha. And Mike and Patty actually adopted their two daughters. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, like, how, so how old were they? I'm sorry. Did you now. say that? So little, like one and two. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah. They were really, really little. So after a 21-year marriage, Mike and Patty actually ended up getting a divorce in 1987. And Mike moved back to Durham, North Carolina, which is where Duke University is. And um, he actually brought Margaret and Martha, his the two adopted daughters, with him. And shortly thereafter, his two sons, Clayton and Todd, came and lived with him. So he is like a single man, newly back in the States, and has four children. Hmm. Two sons and two daughters. And he started writing books and became this like very well-known author. So... He, he writes, like, this one book called The Immortal Dragon, which is a bestseller, and several other novels that did really well. And these novels actually brought him, like, some notoriety and fame and a ton of wealth. So these were books that, from what I understand, were about, like, war times. Mm-hmm. So they weren't, um, like, autobiographical in any way, um, but they were, like, you know, they were novels, but they were about, like, people in war. So then in 1989, he moved in with a lady by the name of Kathleen Atwater. Okay. In Durham. Okay. So he met this woman, they started dating, and they very quickly moved in together. Kathleen was born Kathleen Hunt in 1953 in Greensboro, North Carolina. This woman was smart, like super, super smart, very successful. And she, at the time that they met, was a an executive at a company called Nortel Networks, which is like a telecommunications and like data networking company. And mm-hmm. um, like this was a big job. It was a very, very well-paying job. So she herself was very well off. She had been married to a man by the name of Fred Atwater for about eight years, and she had a daughter named Caitlin. So she lived in Durham near Mike, 
is divorced, is very successful, super fun, loves the outdoors, and she meets Mike Peterson and his four kids, and they move in together and just start this blended family. So they have his two adopted daughters, Margaret and Martha, his two sons, Clayton and Todd, and then Kathleen's daughter, Caitlin. It's like the Brady Bunch. Five children. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Okay. The two of them lived in an enormous house in a very affluent Durham neighborhood. This house, which it, interestingly is currently on the market. Oh, I was just going to ask you, did you drive by? I mean, like. Yeah. I want to. No, I don't <laughs> think you can. I think it's a gated community. I honestly don't even think you can go. But it's 9,400 square feet. And it's currently listed for $1.9 million. I'll just make you an appointment so you can get in there. <laughs> <laughs> they would like one look at my hair and be like, Mm-mm, she, she's a homeschool teacher. <laughs> she, she can't come in here. So um, these people were, they, they were living that life, right? So Mike also, in addition to his novel writing, worked as an opinion columnist for the Durham Herald Sun. And so he was very well known in their community. They were super, super involved in the community in and around Durham and in the county. They were very well respected. You know, here's her with this executive well-paying job. Here's him, this, you know, semi-famous novelist who, you know, is writing for their paper and they're raising five children. They seem very happy. They have like a very idyllic life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, don't you love them kind of? Yeah. Like they seem super great. Yeah, so in real. 19, yeah. In 1999, Mike actually ran for mayor of Durham. Oh, I know. I think if you look up a picture of this guy, you're going to be like, Oh yeah, I know who that guy is. I'm going okay. to right now while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> well, look up a picture of him from like 1999 because he looks different now. Okay. Um, so during his mayoral campaign, it came out that he basically lied about his military service and claims apparently in like the jacket of one of his books that he was injured while in combat in Vietnam and has like decorated, you know, things like he's a decorated officer, which he, he is, but not in what he says he is. He really actually got injured in a car accident in Japan, like nothing to do with combat or anything like that. So like he lost, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, he did not get elected mayor of Durham. The people of Durham were like, sorry, but we don't know. We're not going to play that. So also around this time of like the 2000-ish time, 1999, 2000, um, his writing career kind of began to decline because his most recent novel wasn't doing very well, that he had like co-wrote with a friend. And so, you know, things just were not doing super well. So December 9th, 2001, at 2.40 a.m., a call comes in to 911 from Mike and he reports that he had just come inside and found his wife unconscious and bleeding at the bottom of the stairs. He reports that she had fallen down the stairs, was breathing but barely, and not conscious, and that he believes that she fell 15 to 20 steps. Okay, listen to the 911 call. He hangs up in the middle of the call, which is weird. But then he calls back. He is frantic. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no other way to explain it. He is, like, frantic. He can't even answer the questions that the lady is asking him. Like, she asks him, like, how many steps did she fall down? He's like, what? Just come. What? I don't know. Just come. And she's like, well, how many steps? And he's like, I don't know, 15, 20? Can you come? Like, he is hysterically frantic. Okay. So EMS arrives, and they find Kathleen Peterson at the bottom of the stairs, and she is literally covered in blood, like massive amounts of blood everywhere, on her, on the steps, on the floor, all over the walls, 
up and down the door frame, like massive. I mean, I'm not going to post a picture of this because we don't post pictures of like that, but Mm -hmm. the crime scene photos are insane. They are so disturbing. So the EMTs find that she has this massive amount of blood everywhere and she has severe head lacerations, which seem to be her only injuries. She does have like some bruising on her face, but her injuries seem to be like facial lacerations. And they actually notice at the time that the blood seems to be like a little bit dry. So... They look around, they notice that there's no forced entry. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be like any signs of a struggle anywhere else in the house. And if there was a struggle in the stairwell, it doesn't, it's like minimal kind of like, it's very clear that the blood is coming from her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she's unable to be revived and Kathleen Peterson is pronounced dead at the age of 48. Mike, her husband is immediately seen as a suspect, which is normal. You know, you always start close, work your way out. He was the one, only one there. He called 911. So they kind of separate him. He, I guess, contacts at least some of his children because they come, but they like won't let him talk to them. And I mean, like, it's very clear that he's being seen as a suspect. So he claims, here's his story. He claims that the night of December 8th, 2001, the two of them were watching a movie called American Sweethearts. Mm -hmm. Do you know that movie? I don't. I mean, I've heard the name, but I don't know it. No. Uh, John Cusick. I love him. Oh, I do too. They were watching this movie until 11 p.m. And then after the movie was over, they took some wine out to the back to sit by their pool, which was beautiful. Very beautiful pool. Mm -hmm. And... After a little bit of time that they were sitting out there together, Kathleen decides that she wants to go in because she has an early conference call and Mike stays outside. So later on in the night when he goes in around 2.35, 2.40, he finds Kathleen bleeding at the bottom of the stairs and calls 911. He tells them that she had been drinking, that they had around two bottles of wine that night and that she also took Valium And that she must have just accidentally fallen down the stairs and that that's what happened. Logical thinking. I mean, two bottles of wine, man. (laughs) Well, both of them. Not just her. I know. Like they had shared (laughs) over the course of like the entire evening. And on some Valium. So so. the police. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, (laughs) seems pretty dangerous, but you know, (laughs) whatever. The police questioned. All of this, obviously, immediately, and mostly because of the massive amount of blood that was everywhere. Like, I can't stress this enough. And I feel like it really, like, if you really want to see what I'm talking about, you need to go and Google if your stomach can handle it and your, like, spirit. The the pictures of of her are so gruesome. Like, it's insane. It's truly insane. You immediately look at them and you're like, what happened? You definitely don't immediately look at them and think, oh, my gosh, she fell down the stairs. Mm. Like, it is crazy. Okay. So, the police are like, dude, we don't believe a word you're saying. We think that you had something to do with this. So, they start doing digging into Michael Peterson and his life, and they find the there is a life insurance policy totaling $1.4 million. Okay. That he is the beneficiary for. Okay. So... You know, sirens, here we go. There's the alarm bells. They also then find out that Mike Peterson, Mr. Mayor Mike, has been having affairs on his wife, Kathleen. And these affairs are um, homosexual affairs. He is on multiple websites where he is looking for homosexual um, relationships with uh, military men, gay military men. It's very specific. So they find that, you know, there's a shoe print in Kathleen's sweats that matches Mike's shoe. And 
Then they also find out that they find evidence on and near the computer that Kathleen had very recently become aware of Mike's extramarital relationships or affairs. Okay. okay. When, did you say found a, a shoe print on her? On her sweats? sweats. Okay. That matched his. And then there was also shoe prints like in and around the blood and where he had tracked him and the, you know, tracked it places. This stairwell too, I should mention, it's not like when you walk in your front door and you have an open stairwell. This is like, you know how there's hidden stairwells off the, off of kitchens. Mm -hmm. So it's like the secondary stairwell. So there's walls up both sides. That's what kind of stairwell this was. Okay. So she's almost in like a very confined, dimly lit stairwell. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they have an autopsy done on Kathleen, and it shows that her blood alcohol level was 0.07. So it's under the legal limit of 0.08. She has seven lacerations to the top and back of her head. Okay. They determine, the medical examiner determines that the lacerations are due to consistent with blows from a blunt object that was light and sort of rigid. Okay. So she also had a fracture to the thyroid neck cartilage. I know I had to Google that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Please. And this, <laughs> <laughs> this is an injury caused by blunt trauma or strangulation. Mm. So... It's not a broken neck, but it's an injury to the cartilage in the neck. Her cause of death was blood loss. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she had such severe lacerations to her head that she literally laid there and bled out. Gosh, man, that sucks. I mean, you just, you're, you're aware, right? I mean, maybe she was unconscious, but I mean, oh, can imagine if she was just laying there feeling that pain. Right. Alone too. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they also determined that she actually died 90 minutes to two hours after the injuries occurred. Hmm. And her death was ruled a homicide. Yeah. So based on this evidence, what do you think happened? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm not going to lie. I know the case. <laughs> oh, I, you lie? You did no, lie. I So, no, I don't lie when I say I don't because I'm the queen of not recognizing names. But then when you start oh. talking and saying the case and I'm like, oh, gosh, yeah, right. Oh, I know this one. And I'm, I'm the queen of that. Like, I literally never remember who, what the person's name is unless I'm researching it myself and have it written down. But Got it. I'm going to put that on a tumbler for you. The queen of (laughs) whatever you just said that took five minutes. (laughs) It's going to be perfect. So if I was going to pretend I didn't know, I would say his, her husband hit her with something. I don't know what. (laughs) I know what they assume it is. Um, But, uh, and he just waited essentially for her to die before calling the cops. Hmm. Okay. Well, if you didn't know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong right after this break. (laughs) Hey guys, this is Christy and Beth from Crimes and Closets, and we are just two moms that love true crime podcasts. And so we just thought, hey, why not try and make one of our own? But we had zero knowledge or experience in doing that. And then we found Anchor. Guys, Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It's totally free. There's cool creation tools that allows you to record and edit the podcast right from your phone or computer. It'll distribute your podcast to any platform that you choose, including Spotify and Anchor. And you can actually make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you're as into it as we are, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm to get started. We'll see you in the closet. 
Okay, we are back. And you are right. That is exactly what the police thought. I'm so smart. <laughs> <laughs> or you're a spoiler. <laughs> They, in December, later in December 2001, a couple weeks after Kathleen's death, Mike was arrested for for the first degree murder of his wife and taken to jail. Okay, so he made bail because of his kids. Let me tell you, all of his children, all of them, all five of them, so his two daughters, his two sons, and Caitlin, Kathleen's daughter, all supported this man and believed in his innocence. Okay. Like a hundred percent supported him. Okay. So his trial began in 2003. And at the time of his trial, the prosecution alleged that Kathleen had found out about these extramarital affairs that Mike had been having and confronted him about it. And she had found pornographic photos on his computer and that she had gotten mad and an argument ensued that night and that he killed her, hit her over the head with some kind of light but rigid object. (laughs) And she bled out, basically. And he, after she was almost dead, because she he does report that she was still barely breathing when he called um he basically waited until she was at the brink and then called 911 okay so they hired a forensic expert the prosecution who testified that the blood spatter was consistent with blunt force trauma the medical examiner also testified saying the exact same thing and then they also brought up mike's affairs the information that they found on his computer that they believe Kathleen found. They brought up the shoe print. They brought up the financial difficulties and the life insurance payout. They brought up the fact that he was a liar and had lied in his campaign for mayor about his, and in his books, about his service in the military and just basically tore all of those things apart. And then they also brought up, you know, that, I think I said this, the autopsy. Okay. Mm -hmm. They believe that the murder weapon that he used was a blow poke, which is, you use it in your fireplace and it's like this hollow metal tube that you that has like a poking thing at the end that you blow on. (laughs) I don't know why anyone would ever do this. Do you, you have a fireplace. Do you do that? Uh, Blow to your fireplace? Um, with my lips. (laughs) (laughs) You do? Yeah. I blow in there because it makes the heat, like it helps the fire. Okay. Well, okay. Then I guess I can, maybe I should buy you one of those for Christmas. It's funny because I've actually thought like, I would really like one of these because I'm tired of putting my face in my fireplace and blowing. Yeah. (laughs) Seems really unsafe. I'm going to put, I'm going to put that on the list with the tumbler. Okay. Um, so this fireplace poker was given to the family by Kathleen's sister and it was missing. They couldn't find it. Okay. So they think that was the murder weapon Kathleen apparently also had one of these blow blow pokes. <laughs> Sounds fake when you say it. <laughs> like, is that a real thing? So she had one and she loved her so much that she bought one for several family members. So she had like an identical one that she was able to bring in. And it is like a hollowed out thing that is light and rigid. Okay. So <laughs> I think it's funny that. She liked this so much. She bought it for several family members. That's not usually something that I would think, like, I don't know, like, oh, it's cool. I'll buy it for myself. But right. <laughs> we buy this Here, for everyone. Maybe it, was, maybe it was a new thing back then in the 80s. Yeah, it could be. Oh. Yeah. I don't know what thing people got excited about. I mean, I got excited about neon things in the 80s, but, you know. <laughs> so, Okay. 
The defense brings up that Mike has a very happy marriage, and they actually say that Kathleen was aware of Mike's um, bisexual relationships and or bisexual affairs and that she was accepting of it. His brother testifies that he was well aware of these relation, you know, his brother's like that he was bisexual from a young age and that their parents were aware and that this was really no secret. And Mike, you know, basically says he admits like, yeah, I had sex with other men, but I didn't have like relationships with them. They were just sexual affairs just to satisfy that bisexual part of me. Mm. Okay. And I feel like they kind of hit him really hard on this. And I, I mean, I think the issue was obviously not that the affairs were happening or that the affairs were bisexual. It was the fact that they believe the defense believes that it was, he was hiding it from her. Okay. So like, okay. okay. So the big deal is not because we know people have open marriages and like bisexual relationships and have perfectly functioning, you know, relationships and like to each his own, but the, they believe that he was hiding it from, from her and that he wanted to keep it hidden and did not want this publicized. Although I will say when it did come out, he was definitely like, well, yeah, I mean, I do do that. Like he wasn't mortified at the fact that they found out. So, but that's what they claim. The, t the his kids testify on his behalf and, um, they bring up the autopsy. They show that there are no skull. They bring up that on the autopsy, there's no skull fractures. Mm. There are no, there's no like damage to the brain. So there's no contusions to the brain. There's no hemorrhages, which is really inconsistent with any kind of beating or like rage filled attack, right? You get hit on the head. They're not just going to like, tap you on the head a little bit, they're going to beat the crap out of you to kill you. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would agree. Okay. But there's no evidence that she was hit hard enough to fracture her skull or leave any type of damage to her brain or anything like that. So that's real interesting. Okay. They also produce the missing blow poke. <laughs> That's oh. the prosecutions. Okay, now this is interesting because it doesn't get brought found until like a couple days before the end of the trial. So like the timing of it seems really weird and suspicious, but it was found in the garage or it's like a basement garage. I couldn't really tell. It looked like a basement to me, um, but I saw places where it said garage and it was apparently they said missed by the police. It was like in a corner. And it was covered in like cobwebs and it had bugs on it and stuff. And it looked like to me that it had been like undisturbed for a while. Right. Yeah. That's exactly okay. how it sounds. But this is in 2003 and she was, you know, she died in 2001. So that's two years. But the police missed it. Like it would have had to have not been there in 2001. They would have had to just put it put it there immediately in order for it to be sitting there long enough. Right. And were there no was there no trace of blood on it? No. No blood, no hair. Like it forensically comes back clean. Okay. So the prosecution has a forensic expert to obviously counteract what the uh, or I'm sorry, the defense has a forensic expert that counteracts what the prosecution said about blood spatter and also about um, the injuries to her head. So, like, it's a really big thing that they're saying, like, she has seven lacerations to her head. She, They think she only fell, like, four steps. Mm -hmm. So did she hit every step twice? in order to create seven lacerations, that's what she would have had to have done, right? Right, right, yeah. Okay, 
to get seven because it's like seven different. That's what the prosecution is saying that that like there's no way that could happen. There's no way she could have seven lacerations to her head and nothing else. And are they saying that she only fell down that amount of stairs based on like where the blood started? Yes, that's okay. exactly how. And I think they do agree. Um, both the defense and the prosecution both agree with that. So their expert brings up what he calls like the watermelon theory, which is basically like if you have a watermelon and you take the watermelon and you throw it down, you have one point of impact Mm -hmm. because it hits the ground in one place, but you're going to have more fractures and splits in the watermelon than one. Right. Right. So his point is like, and sometimes you could even do that and the watermelon just busts open completely and falls apart altogether. So that's his theory is that it's like, yeah, maybe she only had like two or three impacts, but those could cause splits and splinters and fractures in her scalp in a bunch of different places. Again, I feel like that's kind of weird because if that's going to happen and something's going to hit hard enough to cause splits and fractures in a bunch of places, she would have skull damage. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Or brain contusions or something. Okay. So this is like the most interesting thing to me, this point right here. The defense talks a lot about the friend of theirs, Elizabeth Ratliff from Germany. Do you remember her back when I was talking about her? Okay. She passed, right? She fell down the stairs. There you go. Ah. She was found dead at the bottom of her stairs. And Mike and Patty, his then wife, adopted her children, Mm. Margaret and Martha. So that death had happened at this point 18 years earlier in Germany in 1985. And... So they investigated this. Someone brought this to their attention and were like, isn't that funny? And they were like, you know what that is? And so they dove into this. And the night that she passed, Mike and Patty and their kids were having dinner with Elizabeth and her girls. Then Patty leaves with the two boys to put them to bed and leaves Mike behind to help Elizabeth put her two girls to bed, which apparently Mm. had been customary since the dad, his friend, had passed. The next morning, the nanny comes in and finds Elizabeth in a pool of blood dead at the bottom of the staircase. Very interesting. I don't think I've heard that one before. Yeah. That to me is like the best, like that's my cherry on top of this little death case. Mm -hmm. So her autopsy at the time determined that her death was the result of an enteral cerebral hemorrhage, which was caused by a blood, stay with me a blood coagulation disorder called von Wildebrand's disease. Okay. So what they basically said was that she had a blood coagulation disorder, which is like you bleed and you can't stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. As a result of this disorder, she had a brain bleed. The brain bleed is what killed her. And she subsequently then fell down the stairs. Oh, okay. So she didn't die from falling down the stairs. She died and then fell down the stairs. That's what the autopsy said. And it, there are reports that she did complain of headaches on occasion. And I think one, the last one was like a couple weeks before her fall, which would support this hemorrhage. Okay. okay. The one thing that I thought was interesting, they brought this nanny to the United States to testify. And she says, she talks about the crazy amount of blood that is found with her. And I don't understand that. Like if you die from a hemorrhage and then you fall, like, I guess maybe she could have gotten injured and like had cuts and scrapes from when she fell. But the nanny literally said that they spent that whole day and part of the next day cleaning up blood. That's how much there was. 
Okay. So, all right. That's a very interesting point, but I, can I go back to something quick? Okay. You said the whole coagulating issue and that she died and then fell. But That's didn't what the they, autopsy. But didn't they say earlier that she sat there for like 90 or like was laying there for 90 minutes before she died? Oh, this is Elizabeth. Oh, so Elizabeth. that. Okay. I'm sorry. I confused it. Sorry. Okay. never mind. Just kidding. Carry on. Yeah. The lady, the <laughs> friend who died in Germany, that's who we're talking about. Yes. Okay. So she, Kathleen, okay. That, that's her theory. Okay. Yes. The medical exam examiner did say Kathleen had, was injured 90 minutes to one hour or to two hours before she died. Yes. Okay. okay. But Elizabeth, they're saying that she died as a result of this hemorrhage and then fell down the stairs. But again, there was still a massive amount of blood. Okay. The, the DA for North Carolina, he went and exhumed Elizabeth Ratliff's body, the friend from Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. With this now what they believe is a suspicious death. She was buried in Texas, brought her to North Carolina, and she was autopsied by the same medical examiner that did Kathleen's autopsy. Despite. Oh, wow. Yeah, despite the prosecution being like, look, there's world-renowned medical examiners in Texas. She can just be done by one there. You don't have to do this. Like, But no, they brought her to North Carolina, and she was examined by the same examiner. Okay. So that med medical examiner ruled that she also died from blunt force trauma to her head, and he actually ruled her death a homicide. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. So, 18 years later. <laughs> right. Okay. But for just one second, if we can like separate ourselves from the case and what's going on, think of these children. Like, think about this. You have these two little girls whose father passed away when they were babies, whose mother then passed away when they were babies by falling down the stairs. They're adopted by another family. And then that mother who raised them dies from falling down the stairs. And then... They go and dig up their biological mother <laughs> in the case against their father, holy adoptive cow. father. Like, holy moly, trauma, trauma to the 10th degree. Mm -hmm. Like, that is so sad. Okay. But that's what happened. So, interestingly, the prosecution declined to press charges on Mike for Elizabeth Ratliff's murder. But all of the information in her case, the circumstances surrounding her death and the medical examiner's report of the new autopsy were used in the trial against Mike. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm not like a legal person, but what is the actual evidence tying Elizabeth Ratliff's death to Kathleen's? Right. I just, it's not there. Like, I don't see it. I think mm -hmm. that's bananas. Okay. So after a 14-week, very highly publicized trial, Mike, with all of this evidence, was convicted of first-degree murder of the death of his wife, Kathleen, and sentenced first-degree murder, okay, and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sheesh. Okay. So that's interesting too, mm -hmm. because you know, the difference in being granted parole and not is based on premeditation. Oh, right. So <clears throat> they, if you premeditated it, they're not going to grant you parole. If you did not, then you could have the possibility of parole. So they are basically saying that he planned this. Not only did he murder her, but he planned it. Okay. So he files several appeals, one based on the fact that Elizabeth's case information was entered into evidence because that's just crazy. Um, he files, you know, a couple like poor handling by the police, um, just like, you know, appeal after appeal. Sometime in 2009, Someone, and I have read that who this someone was, was a neighbor of Mike's, who was also an attorney, but didn't work on the case, but he followed it. 
He brings up what is called the owl theory. <clears throat> it's my favorite theory. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about the owl theory? No, it's okay. You can go on. <laughs> okay. Here's what I know about the owl theory. In the autopsy, in Kathleen's left hand, there was a clump of hair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Inside the clump of hair, there was a sliver of wood and several very tiny owl feathers. <laughs> so that's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So this person, and then also the defense, theorized that Kathleen was possibly attacked by an owl while she was outside. And it caused these scalp lacerations. And she potentially also maybe fell. She maybe fell several times. She was somewhat incapacitated and tried to go in, tried to go up the stairs, and probably fell again and was bleeding very profusely at this point. She may have slipped in her blood. And she ended up falling and going unconscious and passing away. I Wait. am on Go. board with the owl theory. I <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but they are mean <laughs> and will attack. <laughs> and I didn't know any of this until I heard this theory. Okay, here is my one question about the owl theory. They're theorizing that this happened while she was outside walking from the pool into the house, right? Yeah, I guess that would be the most logical time. Okay. Mike was outside, according yeah. to his testimony. Yeah, maybe he's a little snoozing because he just finished two bottles of wine with his wife. <laughs> I got to tell you, girl, if my wife or if my husband was getting attacked by an owl, I would wake <laughs> up and be like, let me get my phone. I mean... I'm sorry. I just don't 100% buy that. I just feel like I don't know what is the deal with the owl feathers. And I do think that obviously an owl's claws can cause these types of scratches. And it does explain why, you know, it doesn't really look like blunt force trauma. Right. Like It does make sense that her head was scratched up. I, I feel like that's true. But I just think he would have heard her like I would have been screaming my head off. If an yeah, owl true. was attacking me, good grief. I scream my head off when a firefly lands on me. <laughs> like, I, people are going to know yeah. if an owl is attacking me. I just think that's weird. But mm -hmm. but I don't know. I don't know about those feathers and the hair and all that. That's weird. And it mm -hmm. does make sense. Okay. So there's the owl theory. Okay. So all of his appeals were denied. But then... Later on, around, I think this was sometime in like, my gosh, I don't know what year it was, but okay, the SBI agent, so the Special Bureau of Investigation, their forensic analysis, who was used in Mike's case to talk about how the blood spatter is consistent with a blunt force trauma and a beating, okay, that guy who forensically testified to that was determined to have, in multiple cases, misrepresented his evidence, lied about his evidence, um, altered the evidence, and also altered some of the testing in order to produce evidence that leaned toward one side or the other. Is his name Fami? His name's Deaver. <laughs> You know who I'm talking about, Fami? No. Oh, he's another another podcast talks about this guy a lot and how he does the oh. same thing, like alters, and they always make fun of that. <laughs> it's hilarious. This guy got <laughs> fired. They fired mm -hmm. him. And people who had been convicted as a result of his testimony were actually getting acquittals. Oh, wow. So, like, it was real bad, real bad. And I can tell you, I listened to that guy's testimony, and I even was like, um, I think he's lying. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> even if I, like there was some of the stuff, the ways he would answer questions. I was like, that guy's shifty. Like I, I was, I did not love him at all, but he was, and he was the only forensic evidence that they had. Like literally oh, yeah. every other piece of evidence that they had on Mike Peterson was like circumstantial about his affairs, about the life insurance, about Elizabeth Ratliff. Like all of it was basically them making him look really bad. The only forensic evidence that they had was this autopsy, the medical examiner, and then this blood spatter guy. So guess what? He was granted in 2011 a new trial. Oh, well. Yes. Yeah. So they got it. They got the appeal. When he was granted this new trial, he was actually released from prison on $300,000 bail. He was told he had to be on house arrest and was given a bracelet. Oh, wow. Wow. Not crazy. So yeah. at that point, he had served like just over eight years in prison. Holy cow. Okay. So then that was 2011. So he's on house arrest. He has a bracelet and he has going to, his case is going to be retried. So two and a half years goes by and nothing happens. So they ask the court if his house arrest can be suspended because at this point he had been on house arrest for two and a half years, which is like unheard of to be wearing an ankle bracelet for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So the court agreed and they granted it. And, you know, I mean, he's still somebody who is like under the watchful eye of the police and wait awaiting his appeal, but he's off house arrest waiting you know, for his retrial. Oh, Lord. And then he, like, runs out of money and has to get, like, a public defender. Anyway, so he, he changes attorneys and stuff. But, um, okay, so then in 2017, his, his retrial is coming up. And just a couple months before, he enters into a plea agreement. So he decides that he does not want to go through with and for his family to have to go through another trial and just, you know, and not know what the outcome is going to be. So he takes a plea called the Alford plea. Have you ever heard of this? Mm -mm. Okay. So it's basically, he says it's a guilty plea, but it's, it's not saying that he is guilty because he did it. It's saying that he is entering a guilty plea because he believes sufficient evidence exists in order to convict him. But he still, like, asserts his innocence. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, like, he's guilty on paper. He pled guilty. But it's a plea saying, I only pled guilty because I believe there's evidence to convict me, not because I did it. Mm -hmm. So because of this guilty, this plea agreement, they reduce the charges to manslaughter and the judge sentence him, sentences him to a maximum of 86 months in prison, but gives him credit for time already served. So he had already served 98 months in prison. Mm -hmm. So he was a free man. Hey, yay, yay. So. Well, I'd take that plea too. I know. I know. <laughs> I mean, but he had already been out of prison for like six years right yeah so yeah. like the thought of going back I mean you would literally do anything I feel like mm -hmm. to not go back to prison after you've been out for six years so he's now 73 years old he still lives in Durham and he still maintains his innocent his children Clayton Todd Margaret and Martha all still stand by him however Kathleen's daughter Caitlin along with Kathleen's family have kind of gone to the other side and now believe that he did, in fact, murder her. Mm. So their family is very divided, which is really sad. Like, they've lost their mom, then they lost their dad for such a long time, and then also lost their sister. So. Gosh, sad. Yeah. And you, this is just a little funny thing. When I was researching this case and I typed his name in, like, one of the first headlines that came on said, Michael Peterson currently lives in a home with no staircases. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank the sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> Can lightning strike three times? <laughs> I oh know. Gosh. 
Oh, wow. So, yeah. What do you think about that? I know what you think. You think an owl killed Kathleen. I just wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'm not going to lie. But I totally get where you're coming at with the, you'd know, he'd hear it, and she'd scream. But I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I don't know that I 100% believe anything or either way right now. Like, I, I just, I don't know. Especially with the the weapon they're saying that it's just covered in cobwebs and doesn't have any traces of anything on it. I mean, he can't be that good. That <laughs> he left a sh- boot no, print on I... her sweats. He'd probably leave some sort of evidence on that. Yeah. What is it called? A blow hole? Blow poke. Oh, blow poke. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know what it's called when I get you one. <laughs> when it shows up on my doorstep from Amazon. <laughs> I'm going to put from Michael Peterson. <laughs> yes. Uh... <laughs> yeah. I'll send you a picture of one of these blue pokes. Okay. Okay. You might not know what it looks like, but yeah, that's that's funny. I didn't know it was called a blow poke. But anyway. Yeah, it doesn't have any sharp edges. I feel right. like I should say that too. Nothing that I feel like would cut her. I right. don't know. I don't know. I don't know what happened to this woman, but I do know that there's a lot of documentaries about him, and I've only watched two. So give me a couple days, and I'll solve the case for you. Okay, you can give us an update on a future episode. I will. <laughs> if you solve it. I'll do it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. You got anything else for me? I do not. I have nothing else, but that was a good one, even though I did sort of know the case. I was you, – you just – still opened my eyes to some things, some new things that I had not heard, like the friend in Germany. So yeah, that's wild. Yeah. 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 I didn't know. I don't know why I haven't heard that one before, but so it was a good one. I liked it. Thank you. Yay. Well, guys, that's all for this episode. And we just want to thank you so much for listening. We love hearing from you. Send your case suggestions to us in an email, crimesandclosets at gmail.com. Find us on our website, crimesandclosets.com. Find us on Instagram and Facebook and send us messages and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts if you want. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets.